Mark Daly, professor here at Prescott College, and I teach environmental studies. I'm a cultural anthropologist who is in the environmental studies program. Um, I entered college, you know, as a freshman, <clears throat> and I was mostly interested in like poetry, literature, religion, you know, real humanities guy. And um, and next thing I know, it, you know, that changed a little bit. And halfway through college, um, I went to China. I studied Chinese. I spent a summer in China, and then I traveled throughout Asia for like three more months. You know, like several countries: India, Nepal. Malaysia, Burma, now Myanmar, Indonesia, etc., rural China. And it just blew my 20 year old mind to see the rest of the world, including um, poverty and malnutrition and stuff like that. And so I came back from that in the second half of college. I was like, how did the world get this way? Like, what? what's this all about? And so I turned more to history and anthropology, like the second half of my college career. So, um, um, the other stuff never left me. Now I'm like all of the above. I still love literature and poetry and religious study. You know, like just kind of, it's all there now. Um, and so when it came time to go to graduate school, the person I'd met and married by that time was an anthropology major and going to anthropology graduate school. So, and I ended up taking just a few courses and I loved it. And so I was like, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. This answers my questions. This gets me really interested in the world. So I really latched on to anthropology like officially when I went to graduate school. I'll start not with my identity as an individual human being, but my identity or status of being a member of Homo sapiens sapiens and the product of four million years of evolution. This is like one of my bullet things. Is that, um, um, first of all, like what is art? Capital A art. I think of art as like creative, imaginative, um, um, creativity and imagination based on our evolved capacity for symbolic thinking and, um, and metaphoric thinking. So like we're a symbolic species. There's one book about humans like the symbolic species language right now. These sounds are arbitrary. So like mm -hmm. languages, but right now we're talking, this is entirely through symbolic language, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, what I'm trying to say is, I think the artistic impulse is something creative and imaginative and linked through like the um, attaching wings to ordinary thoughts through symbolic uplift and metaphoric transference through wormholes into other realms. All this far out stuff we do mentally is an evolved capacity that we're born, we grew up and like, wow, we inherited. So to me, like being artistic is like a natural, like, you know, here in Buddhism, like Buddha nature, our original nature, like if you want to call like what we've evolved to be kind of our nature now, I think our nature is to be artistic and creative and symbolic. So in terms of my identity, it's simply in the process of thinking, in the process of talking, in the process of doodling, in the process of dreaming, I am expressing my deepest artistic self because that's what I share with all members of our species mm -hmm. is one way to think of that question. Totally. Um, there's a lot more to it, you know. Can, do, I, do I want to try to make it personal? What's art meant to be personally? Um, I don't know, maybe it's too much to go into because I'm not sure what to say other than what's maybe poetry. You know I love poetry and, mm -hmm. and I've loved poetry since elementary school. So I don't, some things maybe I can't or won't explain because I'm not sure how I do it. Maybe I could, but I've just always been interested in poetry. Um, a little bit of education helps, and I remember sitting through the history of art in college and going, oh, wow, and ever since and appreciating more. So, like, evolved capacity is nice, but, but having exposure and experience and mentors and a little bit of cool education here and there also suffuses it with, with color and imagination we might let run dry. Well, first of all, there's, like, four major subfields of anthropology, biological, cultural, linguistic, and archeological. So each of those would have their different take on it, right. you know? Um, sticking broadly with sort of cultural, which mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, anthropologists are interested in um, what people do, what people think, why they do it, why they think it, um, the implications of it, this sense or coherence it makes to them within their worldview and within their language. So art's just, another piece you know arts just like kinship or cooking mm -hmm. or language or child rearing or technology or agriculture there's we also think about art and um what do i have down here you know friends like 
what are the roles? Are, are artists specialists or is everybody kind of an artist, you know? Um, what are the functions of it? Is it commodified? Do you sell it in the market? Is it religious purpose? Is it just beauty around the fireplace? What are the norms around it? How do they negotiate a changing world regarding production of art? How is it communicated? Is it gendered? Is this something the men do? Or is it something everybody does? Or do you have to be hereditary this? Um, how does it tie into ethnic identity and ethnic performance? So, you know, dot, 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 etc. Anthropology could look at art just the way anthropology looks at anything to try to understand how humans, what humans do and think um, comparatively. And so there's that, it's not boring, but like so far I haven't said anything like controversial, just like art's part of human experience, so it's one inroad into thinking about it. I think another way anthropologists could look at art um, is, is how it's used as, as a discourse um, among different groups, especially groups with differential power how it enters into inequality. Mm. And here I'm thinking of all the fun stuff, you know, like folk songs. Um, Mm -hmm. What's the old um, Jesse Fuller folk song, The Monkey and the Engineer, about a monkey that leaps on and and runs the train down the track. And it's like, wow, he did a good job. And I thought it was a cute song. It's like a um, song written by an African-American parroting white control, like putting african-american folks in the crappy jobs while the white people are engineers Mm -hmm. he's saying we can do this too you know folk Mm -hmm. songs that under the radar thing um i'm thinking chinese poetry um they used to say like the clouds have covered the sun meaning the last emperor was good this guy's you know corrupt jerk and all of his um corrupt ministers are hiding which she'd be a noble op you know all these Mm -hmm. like so art is used to say a lot slant you know kind of like um without really saying it, and that gets interesting into power. Um, what else do I have here? Uh, I suppose that's probably enough. Even thinking of like the birth of um, the blues, acoustic country blues and jazz. All these are from like um, suffering, comparatively disempowered, marginal ethnic groups in American society. So that stuff's often fertile soil for, because you don't have the means of production, you don't have power, you don't have I mean, you have art. Mm -hmm. You know, you just arts free in it. When you open your mouth, it can be there. And so it's often like um, a a fulcrum between power and powerlessness in a kind of symbolic but real way, too. Um, And I'll say one more thing, and that's a power, holistic perspective. And then I think art and anthropology intersect again from an evolutionary point of view. Like we were, you know, apes are not do not think symbolically. Um, no other mammal thinks symbolically. I mean, other mammals are really smart at all this, and they, you know, but 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 like this full-blown symbolic. We create symbolic worlds in our minds. So, um, I mean, you know, I want to mention like ritual, um, theater. These things are symbolic performances, make believe, as this as if this is real, and then we get sucked in, and it becomes real, and it communicates mm-hmm. messages. Um, this, to me, this has roots in probably like shamanic transformation, you know, or or just the capacity of humans to do this. I think we were imitating animals and telling supernatural stories, um, what we call theater around the fire 80,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, so I guess there's that, I guess I'm saying that other part where it ties in with evolution. Mm-hmm. I always think an evolutionary perspective is far out and interesting no matter what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And so maybe art comes about the time with the symb- um, evolution of language. Mm-hmm. And we yeah. don't know if that's like, 80,000 years ago, 300, 400,000 years ago, probably came in stages, but, so it's just fun to think about, mm-hmm. you know, that other totally. part, the biological evolutionary part, where it came from. Yeah, you know? that's really, I mean, <clears throat> I, I love that you brought up, like, the evolutionary perspective, because um, there's a lot of people that really think of art as what really, um, and creativity is mm-hmm. what differentiates us from other animals, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, and again, like, we don't really know how the you know creative capabilities of animals to mm-hmm. you know a full extent, but um, that's always interesting to sort of think about is that um, you know art is what really makes us human in a lot mm-hmm. of ways, um, and um, yeah, that's uh, interesting. Like yeah, and I guess to think of another, there's um, cognitive anthropology, which you can bring in evolutionary roots, but you don't mm-hmm. have to. But how does the mind work? How does it categorize things? What are metaphors? And I remember, like, like poetry and art 
draws on metaphor, which is like, I think it was like cross-wiring dissimilar domains. Like that's the nerdiest thing I've ever said. But like, um, like, we like um, temperature versus emotional closeness. Mm. Like, like our relationship's really cooling off lately, or like, wow, it's heating up. You know, mm. we cross. It's like crosswiring your car, like thermal temperature like emotional connection and we use yeah. different things to express different things we do it all the time i'm filling up i'm feeling down these are simple ones mm -hmm. but um um the conversation slowed to molasses and stuff like that yeah. um the human capacity genius fun thing we do is cross our domains all the time mm -hmm. so it's how our brains are built yeah and i think that's where you know we all do it in simple ways that maybe the, the the special artists among us do it really well and in unexpected mm -hmm. ways with clarity of color or language and you know yeah. so it's all how our mind works and art is like um somebody once said art is life with the boring parts taken out mm -hmm. you know so it's kind of what <laughs> yeah. we it's kind of what we already do it's a condensation right. of our potential and absolutely with some craft thrown in if you're gonna yeah you know learn how to do it well totally and I, I was thinking about um you know the evolution um, aspect um, and just thinking about like some things that uh, Terence McKenna says about mm -hmm. um, art and natural phenomena being very similar and that mm -hmm. evolution is um, it continues to get more complex mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um, which is you know we see that in art um, especially you know with technology and you know these revolutionary art movements that happen uh like cubism and, and all mm -hmm. of that where you know fundamental sort of um values and um were challenged you mm -hmm. know um and that's you know that's where i get you know the history inspires me so much for yeah. like the potential of what art can do um for society mm -hmm. um in I that evolutionary sense of moving uh -huh. towards a more democratic or yeah uh you know and of course real biological evolution isn't headed anywhere right you know there's no but so we don't never know what's going to happen in that regard but in terms of our human efforts to make some world we want right i just thought of a haiku i read the other day it's i went back to the japanese greats you know and busan i think said um where art begins a rice planting song in the back country and i was like <laughs> oh i don't know if that's true or not but i just like it you know that's just excellent. And I, that's a good point to make, too, I guess, but it's probably obvious to you and me and anyone who would listen to this that when we mean art, we don't mean grand funded opera or, right. you know, it's not like <laughs> one person out of a thousand doing something. It's right. um, it's it's my late grandfather, like sticking a pink flamingo, you know, all these garish things in the yard. It would be half embarrassing, but it was his artistic impulse. He mm -hmm. would have sunflower planters out of old tires and paint. You know, it's what we all do. Humor is artistic that involves at least creativity yeah you know people who can't read or write and you know dig ditches for life can be damn funny and have you know hilarious commentators and that involves unexpected juxtapositions language to you know so everybody's creative um everybody's perhaps an artist or at least has the potential to be but mm -hmm. you know then some people specialize i've been reading robert piercig Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, uh -huh. and um, it's uh, definitely got got me thinking about quality and value, um, mm -hmm. as it should do. Um, <laughs> and um, I, 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 this is kind of a big existential crisis for me as a student, as an artist, um, where, um, you know, is is value or quality in art completely subject subjective? You know, or or is there a higher art of quality, right. an objective sort of um, medium hmm. of of art? And and a follow up question: How might um, you know anthropology, ethnography, arts based studies, and culture help to right, right. answer this question? Any community of artists and perhaps citizens at any particular nexus of culture, history, and time have their own kind of standards. And, you know, you can't say it's like, this is right, because 30 years later, it's going to look like oppressive patriarchal bullshit. It'll look great in 1928, you know? So <laughs> it's not like these things change all, don't change all the time. But I have 
come to rely on and trust. You have to get outside of yourself is what I'm saying. Like we can create for the therapeutic effort of it and that's awesome. And you could do something like, I like this, that's awesome. Um, but if you want art to enter like an interactive realm, to put it out there, to see what other people think, I think it is beholden on anyone to listen um, to what other people's feedback is and um, think critically from as many points of view as possible to try to get out of your own head and evaluate your stuff. Maybe still subjective, from other people's subjectivities then if you like, if there's no objectivity. Mm -hmm. um, I came through this through haiku and that, you know, I'd write some like, oh, this one's great, you know, right. and it would never get accepted. Right. And I came to like trust editors like, They've done this a long time. There's something wrong with this. Maybe it's mm -hmm. just trite. They've seen it 50 times before. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. You know, all these early haikus write about the shadows of things or in the mirror and like, it's been done a thousand times. If, you're not, if it's not going to be fresh and new, you know, they're going to go, oh, another one of these. And so it's good to have a network or a community within a particular artistic tradition. And um, I would maybe not master it, but like know it in a way you don't reinvent the wheel um, accept feedback from others and also draw creativity like we're a social species and art is part of being social whether it's in the language or the traditions or practices and so it's not an impediment it doesn't deny our individuality it's something we use just like a sea anemone open in the water um, draws on passing nutrients you know so art it's an individual thing but it's also not, and right. I think artists would be good to remember that, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, we gather nutrients from the water around us, the alphabet soup of language we spoon from, you know. I, I'm not even sure if I'm still on the question. Oh, no, definitely. Um, definitely. Um, so there may, not be a, there may be no objective standard of what art should do or what its craft should be, or at least it evolves, but, but notice, practice, and appreciate the con socio-cultural context and time you're in as a way to think about your art. Mm -hmm. and then you came back to anthropology and let me just do that in one simple sentence. An internet anthropologist can look at that, you know, just yeah. or help you think about the politics of it, the, the norms of it, how this was part of Tamil separatism to have this artistic motif or, you know, you could get into case studies and yeah. thinking across culturally with a thousand different questions. But, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I think you know, thinking in a, you know, ethnographical uh, way about art in the Western world is that it is highly commodified and that it, mm -hmm. the, our sense of value is very entangled with um, money. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's a big tribute, but also just there is this, I'm really interested right now in looking at um, just this fear of engagement with art. I've always, you know, I've grown up with a family of artists that's always been mm -hmm. in my nature to be doing it, and I don't really feel very much um, fear with engaging with it, whereas others um, feel that insecurity because of maybe the external conditions of mm -hmm. societal expectations of what a finished product should look like mm -hmm. um, and how it should be meaningful. Um, and so I think that's maybe where I tend to um, challenge uh, and maybe clash with, you know, art teachers where it's like, how can you say if they're not putting in the work, like as much work as they can, um, if they're not trying hard enough, you know, how are we to know? Because, you know, I personally value the process much more than I value the, the end result. I'm not even sure if there is an end result with art, but... Um, yeah, I guess that's kind of been, you know, I think that it is important to know the technique, you know, mm -hmm. and the craft, um, and then, then break the rules, you know, to have like yeah. the historical context or the cultural mm -hmm. context of why this is valuable and this isn't yeah. valuable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's, yeah. I've been thinking about that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Interesting thoughts. Like, the idea that a lot of people are intimidated by it and, or just like be creative, do art. I guess I don't know. Is it a society thing? Maybe just so formally asking the question, posing it like that. It's like telling someone to get up and make a speech. I I think a, a lot of people have. Obviously, there's like a ninety-eight percent overlap between um, your 
experience of yourself and your mind and your va- and what you, your self identity, and then producing um, public art. I think most people approach art probably like or you know dashing off a little poem. It's something kind of therapeutic and something they right. just want to do. Um, but if you're going to also share it and enter a community of artists, like it's not just that anymore. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe that's the part that's intimidating to people. They feel like the therapeutic part. It's like saying, you know, um, I always had a difficult relationship with my father, and you have to stand up and say that, and everybody hears it. Mm-hmm. Whereas um, it's hard to, to for people not to think of art as like revealing their soul, which can be part of it, but it's I don't know what I'm trying to get at here. Like I wish people would would think of it not quite so restrictively. It's yeah. just you know, just. Um, singing a song with other people and have not so much I wish people wouldn't put so much pressure on themselves I think right. that's it there's a pressure when you yeah. like, be creative now it's like what does that mean right you know the trick is to trick people into it slowly you right know? let's draw something or definitely and haiku's fun because they're short and not as intimidating as a sonnet you know mm-hmm. like right that. yeah where there's like this expectation of quality always yeah, yeah. and like yeah um and I mean, quality itself is, it seems very subjective also. Like, again, with like, you know, where are you living? Where are you? Um, what's your history? Um, you know, I think about that when I think about values in, in society mm-hmm. and like, mm-hmm. um, where did they come from? Yeah. Like um, right now, art is being, um, well, it has always been used for social justice mm-hmm. purposes, but um, maybe it's because we're at Prescott College and it's 2021 and... <laughs> Black Lives Matter, and we just got Trump out of there. But, but the like the the power of art to speak to power. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's never been more obvious. It, it probably, but it always has been. I think as yeah. long as there's been inequality, there's been someone singing a song or mm-hmm. doing a painting or doing something from down yeah. below. Absolutely. And um, we all have our lineages. I think there, there's this like. Yeah, I'm Homo sapiens, therefore I, I can do art in a mad, that kind of whole spiel. But I think we also all have our little lineages. Did, did you grow up watching sitcoms your whole life? Yeah. And therefore, that you know, you think of jokes like that. Um, for me, I think it's very male, I suppose, but it's um, kind of the beatniks, you know, Kara, mm-hmm. Gary Snyder, sure. all those guys. Absolutely. That's kind of my wellspring. Go back to William Blake, go through to like other people later. But mm-hmm. um, but I think of, I had some other fun, I forget, but um, um, yeah, use your lineage or something like that, or it's yeah. fun to think about. I'm curious what you think of the term utopia, um, because um, a, a lot of the work that I did this past uh, semester and I guess a year with Ruth is kind of like this idea of using performance and arts to, to try and envision a utopia mm-hmm. um, or, or a democracy, um, if either of those are possible. And like, not necessarily and then maybe how then generating it once we can yeah. define it um I know, and i know that utopia is kind of a it's a very dangerous you know mm-hmm. word um kind of like um yeah just really you 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 fall into biases of what society should look like um and so it's it's dangerous yeah. to think that there's one ideal but um yeah i'm just curious um how art might evolve society towards um more democratic um, yeah. or utopian sort of yeah yeah, yeah i'm thinking like I, i'm of sort of two related minds here one is that to think art can be used to draw us toward some sort of utopia more democratic society that i think it's awesome and i think it can ideally you know like laughs like yeah you know like at least at least reminds us of the possibilities right and even if utopia is an elusive concept always beyond your reach you know the mathematical concept of an asymptote like draws closer and closer to line it never gets there so i think of like ideas of utopias and our highest values are kind of like asymptotic like absolute ideals that we use to orient ourselves it's a kind of compass mm-hmm. to, to like hone our craft and think of our values and so all for that, yes, it can. It, it, it's progressive. You never know where it's at, but it's a good orient, orienting value system. Think about what you're doing art for. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I think you're right that I am also wary of 
hitching art to almost any kind of absolute purpose and having that hitch be a firm lock. Um, um, the Cultural Revolution in China, the Maoist Revolution, they made said all art should only serve class revolution, and they just stopped everything. You know, everything else, but unless it's like, you know, overthrow the landlord, the landlord, and all this stuff, <laughs> and like, and everything else was to me like, some part of me is like, art should not be owned by anybody, even the most noblest of causes. It can be used by it, but I, 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 I want to have art that comes from nowhere. You're not sure where it came from, where it came from. And it's just a small statement of something right now and right here. Like, will we therefore criticize art that doesn't serve utopian or democratic ends as frivolous? I, I would strongly like to think we need wild spaces in our minds. Mm -hmm. And I think creativity has to, in part, come from wild spaces. And so I hate to have any kind of even worthy moral idea start to chain, prescribe what art can or can't do. There's, that there's, it's propaganda. Yeah, so yeah, so I, and there's a, there's a poem, for instance, you could probably pick a million thing by Carl Sandburg about a platter being um, moved around in like a Polish beer hall in 1920, and he just looks down, and on the platter are these fishes, you know, like um, a design, and it's just wearing out, fading, and he has some like four line poem about these fishes like fading, fading through the thousands of beers between customer. It's just you know. Who would, not a big deal, but what's the purpose of that poem? Mm -hmm. Other than he just, something struck him in an almost like haiku like image fashion right here, mm -hmm. right now. I, w I, I would be uncomfortable if we ever gave up art for art's sake and we're not sure what the hell it's about. I like right. the wild spaces, but I also don't think art should nest. Um, art, I also believe art can be used, of course, in a social field for political purposes. Mm -hmm. Totally. So it's like both and, either or, or something like yeah. that. Yeah. I, I wrote a short essay on, on this, kind of like how we assign certain art forms to different roles mm -hmm. um, in society um, and how that's very dangerous. Um, you know, while it's, it's true that, you know, social... I mean, art is just naturally... Um, extroverted into mm -hmm. different fields I think mm -hmm. it just wants to be everywhere um, but it's int I think it, it gets a little dangerous when you only see it as social justice or you only mm -hmm. see it as therapeutic mm -hmm. um, and so it's like um, attachment or connection with dignity with like mm -hmm. intention um, mm -hmm. of what art is on its own and what mm -hmm. it's capable of doing without being assigned to a role of social justice yeah. or therapy mm -hmm. and that's kind of one of the problems I see at the school here is that um, art most of the art courses that still exist here are um, expressive art therapies mm -hmm. um, and that's great you know like art is very therapeutic and um, it helps yeah. when people get into it in the way we worry exactly they may not exactly yeah. a safe space for them yeah. to enter um, but then also that's kind of where I've struggled doing performance in this community is kind of like um, people expect that safety mm -hmm. um, and it's very hard to communicate maybe more radical ideas in art if your intention is to make change mm -hmm. and to transform you know people's ways of thinking um, it's very hard to do that um, when there is kind of this expectation of safety and security yeah. in a right, performance right. space or an art performance because this is an incubating space and right. safe and then Maybe when the incubator opens, radical voices can take flight and figure that all out exactly. in society or something. So yeah, I guess something I've, I've struggled with as an artist here is sort of like trying to find that balance of like um, meeting the spectator somewhere in the middle where I'm not, you know, suppressing or policing my um, creative expression. Mm -hmm. um, I'm being authentic, but I'm also not I'm aware of who my audience is and where I am and yeah just trying to meet them somewhere in the middle where they, they won't react um, feeling triggered or attacked by something provocative or um, and that's you know a lot of my work is very provocative yeah. so I think about that a lot um, this is in the classroom that's its own set of things to consider right but in society like 
heart probably should provoke or right. you know at exactly. least do something to someone checking it out so yeah can't feel too bad about our and i guess part again um like science universe how old is it what are neutron stars this and that you kind of want to head asymptotically towards a kind of objective truth to me like I want to think and talk about art forever, but also never want to pin it down like a butterfly. Right. I want it to be kind of from a wellspring that that um, that we never quite define. I thought it's, it's not quite related to what we're talking to now, but I remember where I headed early, was headed early about the beatniks. Mm-hmm. It's um, Neil Cassidy mm-hmm. and then later Jerry Garcia. Garcia said in an interview once that like he, you know, he, he sort of, I attribute who I am to like beatnik literature and art. Mm-hmm. That's where I came yep. from. And he said with Neil Cassidy, for the first time I considered um, one's life as an art form. That maybe not being a painter or a musician, but like living your life as an art form. And I thought, wow, you know, there's a little pressure off too. I don't know if it's pressure on or pressure off, right. but maybe you don't, you know, get $80 canvases and know how to do all the paint, but maybe there's. You know, there's a lot of ways to be creative and artistic, mm-hmm. and that, and I think another thing about art, in addition or beyond, or alongside social and political purposes, is a kind of pure delight in the act of creating and, ha- and surprising yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, this is like I write like haiku, and this I'll quote one is not good. I just like the other day, um, what was it? Yeah, blah blah blah. Maybe like. I, know, I remember, like, something like, again, it's not good, but um, undecided at the four-way stop, plastic bag, you know, this thing was in the road. And, and so to me, it also, any little kind of practice helps you notice and think. If something helps you think about the world and takes you out of the normal default mode you're in, red light, go, green, I mean, the opposite, <laughs> red light, stop, green light, go, <laughs> da, 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 yield, da, da, you know, that's almost a mini radical act mm. of, of keeping life renewable yeah. and not falling into a routine that may be controlled by someone else or simply everyday um, uh, uh, workmanlike mind or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, art goes from the atom to the universe with all the politics and social stuff in between. Um, I wanted to ask you about spirituality and art oh. intersecting <laughs> in, in different cultures. Oh God, that's just like, it's a humongous entwined Venn diagram, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Spiritual experience everywhere and at all times has manifested itself in part in art. I mean, all times everywhere. And that's visual art, poetic art, theater. Um, We come up with a million examples. Um, Maybe a more slightly interesting question for us is say you're an atheist or at least you're not a practicing member of a particular religion can art itself the process of art um be akin to religious or spiritual Mm. experience without the formal isms um that can and i i personally think yeah there's something there um i don't know whether it's Taoism or zen or we don't need a word for it or you know buddhism talks about our original nature throw an evolutionary perspective in our original nature might be evolved you know like here we are right now like original meaning our capacities um i lost faith i was a kind of a good christian kid and kind of just faith just bottomed out just lost it around age 14 or 15 and if anything you know i and i went through a period i'd say almost of kind of depression like what is there is there any compass Um, And I found some answers, I guess, but um, part of that, at least functionally, is the practice of art, of of poetry um, for me. And I think partly because it takes you out of yourself a little bit. You're using yourself to take yourself out of yourself in two ways. I think of ego, identity, and the person like, I'm going to do this, now I'm going to do that, as a person holding a lamp at a little gateway between vast hordes of the unconscious and we don't know how far it goes what you dream tonight's down there somewhere we don't know it's going to be and then the rest of the universe we're just this little speck um deleting ourselves we're in some kind of control this gate and to me art partakes of what's beyond the gate deep down in that darkness and above it in the 
birdie air, you know? And yeah. so it's similar to religious experience in that way. And it can like take you out of yourself, have an emotional, intuitive connection with things beyond yourself. So that's my, my personal answer. Like, yeah, I think mm -hmm. art can have sort of a spiritual element. It's probably different for everybody and and everybody's gonna put it in different words and and um you know, and maybe a way another person put it, we roll our eyes, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of crazy sure. you know, sure. far out ways of thinking about it, but Yeah. Yeah. Some guy I read as a teenager, Antonin Arto, A R T A U D mm -hmm. is probably yeah, I think he was in a mental institution for a while, said no one has ever this is a paraphrase, no one has ever paint sculpted or wrote other than to get out of hell. Mm. You know, it's just like, <laughs> yeah. oh, damn. You know, we're all like, like, wow, well, butterflies and the cosmos and right. like, you know, so there, there's, whatever it is, there's a need for it. Yep. And I think it's deeply wired, but it's also soft wired and that mm -hmm. we, we all need it in different ways, socially, individually.